show starts in. Good afternoon, Dr. Ayman. So nice to see you again. So nice to see center you. Love. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, really nice to see you again. Um, on this really good day, um, the day of the release of this fantastic new book. Um, yeah, um, just for people who haven't um, seen um, the work that you do across across social media and obviously in the Amen Clinic. So you able to just give a, a brief background of the amazing what you do? Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, Amen Clinics, we have nine clinics around the United States. And we look at the brain before we go about changing it. So we uh, do a brain imaging study called SPAC that looks at blood flow and activity. It looks at how your brain works. And it has taught us, for example, anxiety disorders aren't one thing in the brain. There are like seven different things. And giving everybody the same treatment is sort of silly. And whenever we evaluate people, we always think of them in four big circles. It's what's your brain doing what's the biology what's your mind doing what's the psychology what are your relationships doing the social circle and why the heck do you care which is the spiritual circle so understanding people it's understanding them in those four circles and getting them well it's not just take this or that medication we think that's just not adequate. It's getting well in all four of the circles. And in the new book, I'm so excited, it's out today. Fantastic. You know, I've been thinking about this book for a long time. It really operates in all four of those circles. Uh, the scheming dragons, and I use the analogy of dragons because Tolkien what made you come Hobbit. up with dragons, Dr. Raymond? What was the reason you chose dragons? Well, there are influences always breathing fire on our emotional centers. And uh, if we don't tame the dragons, we're unhappy all the time. So it's like a modern day Game of Thrones uh, battle in your head mm. and uh, they're the dragons from the past that are still breathing fire on us I actually have a puppet of one of them this is the ancestral dragon yeah, the, I put it in my stories I, I don't know if you saw it um, I shared it in the stories um, with it reading the book <laughs> genetic code by your parents or grandparents or great-grandparents that we hold trauma from generations mm -hmm. and uh, there's also the scheming dragons which are um, how society is stealing our mind um, the they them and other dragons where we're listening to people alive and dead still in our head. Like I listen to my grandfather who was a very positive influence for me and my father who was not always so positive. But if you can separate yourself from the chatter in your head, understand where it comes from, you can be free of it to live the life you want. Mm. And obviously, given the circumstances we've all been under um, over the, the previous year, uh, which dragons do you think really have, have come to center stage um, over the pandemic? Which ones would you say have really um, rose up? Well, the anxious dragon, which was already a big deal, 30% of the population struggled with anxiety before the pandemic. That number's up over 50% 
now. Yeah. I mean, it's really an insane time. Um, the grief and loss dragon, so many people, they've lost friends, they've lost loved ones, they've lost businesses. Um, the death dragon, which actually one of the most interesting dragons, it usually rears its head during midlife when you have parents uh, or parents of your friends die and you begin to wonder, is this all there is? But now the death dragon is visiting children. Children are thinking about their own death, which um, is driving a lot of angst and anxiety and fear. And then the wounded dragon, if you think of the first responders who just got overwhelmed medically in the beginning of the pandemic, that that trauma is going to last for a long time unless we actively do things to help them. What, what do you, obviously, I know that, like you say, the, the knock-on effects um, and for mental health um, is going to be for years to see. What action do you think that we can put in place to to try and try and, well try and make it not go out of control and spiral? Well, I think we need to change the conversation. Uh, I'm actually I hate the term mental illness. You interviewed me on that before. Mm. Um, I just think it's wrong. You know, I want to get people excited. Actually, I want you to help me with this. Um, I, I want it to be cool to get brain help. I, I want it to be exciting to have a better brain. That, you know, nobody really wants to see a psychiatrist. Nobody really wants to be labeled as defective or abnormal. But everybody wants a better brain. So what are the things we can do to make it like, well, of course, I have to do that, right? I got to go get my hair done, not me. I mean, mine's pretty easy to take care of. But, you know, people are excited to go on vacation. They're excited to get a healthier body and go to the gym. Nobody's excited about having a better brain. And I think that's really a marketing problem. Do you think it's because, obviously, I know you've, you've got the largest uh, database of brain scans and looking at brains, but do you think it's because we haven't looked at the brain specifically? Absolutely. Uh, I think once you look at your own brain, I know for me it was true, you fall in love with it mm. and then you realize you never should do anything to hurt it. And one of my patients who was a mixed martial artist and had been around toxic fumes as a uh, painter, when he saw his brain, he said it was like seeing his first child for the first time. And when you saw his child, he knew he would never purposely do anything to hurt the child. He was filled with love and attachment. And that's what I think we need to do for the brain. We need to like be filled with gratitude for our brains because it makes us who we are. And then be committed to never hurt it but to give it all the resources it needs. So if I think of my four children, I will always give them the resources uh, for them to be successful, right? I mean, that's just love. Um, I need to do that same thing for my brain um, because if I don't, it not only hurts me, it hurts the people I care about. Mm. No, it's a beautiful metaphor. And like you say, it's about shifting that idea, isn't it? That uh, making brain care just as important as, as physical um, health, because it is. And I love, the, I love the, the take that you say that obviously psychiatry before um, looking at the brain, brain specifically, it was almost like a shot in the dark, wasn't it? Going off symptoms and not actually specifically looking at the brain. Well, if you think about it, um, we are the only medical specialty that virtually never looks at the organ it treats. I mean, think about that. A cardiologist would never act like that. An orthopedic doctor would never act like that. You wouldn't want them to act like that. <laughs> no, um, you want them 
you want as much information as you can to help your patients. No, definitely. And um, like you said, then then there's so many different routes when when you know the root cause, which which is fantastic. Going back to the dragons, um, would you say that you have a favorite dragon? So obviously when you were writing and getting really creative with this, uh, which, which would you say is your favorite dragon that you like to explore? Well, I love the ancestral dragon because it's so freeing for people when they know their anxiety may actually come from someone else. That there's this whole new field of medicine called epigenetics where my habits, my experiences get written into my genetic code that I then pass on to my children and grandchildren. And so um, doing family histories and genealogies to understand what, um, what your history is written in your genes. Yeah. Um, for example, my wife, uh, who I know you interviewed, um, her grandmother grew up in Lebanon during the Great Famine of World War I. And um, she really had a deprivation mindset written in her genetic code. And so when the pandemic had started, Tana already had a pandemic room. And, and I've been irritated with her for years because I'm like, why are you spending money on all of these things? We live in Newport Beach. You know, when is the yeah. store ever going to be out of toilet paper? <laughs> and you can imagine well, I have no clout anymore ever. <laughs> I'm never going to be able to say no. anything. But I think her grandmother's story was written in her genes and that's why um, she was prepared for disaster. Um, my Did grandfather, when he came to the United States, his brother was killed in a train accident. Uh, his car crashed into a train. And my grandfather actually never drove. Even though he worked for General Motors, he never drove because of the anxiety he held. And when I was a little child, I used to bite my fingernails almost till they bled. And it's like, why was I so anxious? I think that got written into my genetic code. So just knowing about it, knowing it's not me, it's just something I inherited that I can work on and therefore I don't have to pass that anxiety to yet another generation. Would you say, is there a specific um, percentage of, of people? So like you say, if anxiety disorders or, or being overly anxious um, runs, runs in the family, is there a specific percentage that we have on how many people that would be? So is that if every person who has an anxious parent would then more likely uh, develop anxiety growing up? Or is it like one in three? Well, we know before the pandemic, it was virtually one in three uh, right. people. Now, if you come from anxious people, you're at a higher risk for it. But genes are not destiny. Okay. Genes are vulnerability. The genes load the gun. It's our behavior that pulls the trigger. And we have uh, a high school course, and we're actually working on a grade school course now, teaching kids to love and care for their brains. And the kids who take the high school course decreases drug, alcohol, and tobacco use, decreases depression, anxiety, and improves self-esteem. These are skills, and you know this, that everybody can learn diaphragmatic breathing. Everybody can learn meditation, hypnosis, and learning how to not believe every stupid thing you think, that thoughts are not real, they're not reality, they're often created by the funny chemicals going on in our brain. We can learn to manage anxiety. No, 100%. And why you say, obviously, uh, in the community, we get we get questions surrounding, like you say, thoughts, overthinking. Um, 
A question regarding intrusive thoughts. Obviously, we get a lot of uh, people who who are wary and worried about intrusive thoughts. Do you think that everyone, regardless of if, if they're going through an anxiety disorder, um, deals with intrusive thoughts? Just that their the behaviour um, is different towards it, so they they won't zone in on it and they won't fixate on it. It might just pass pass the pass them in the mind and they not know. You know, everybody has weird, crazy, stupid, sexual, violent thoughts that nobody should ever hear. Mm -hmm. uh, Jerry Seinfeld once said, the brain is a sneaky organ. Um, but there's nowhere in school where they actually teach you to manage your thoughts. No. And um, there's a whole section in the book on exactly how to do it. In fact, there's an exercise. Um, if you give me a hundred, of your worst thoughts, I'll change your life. And I give you a process uh, to write down a hundred of your bad thoughts and then question them. So there's a very specific methodology on how to question them. And ultimately, if you do a hundred, then whenever a thought pumps, pops up in your head, you'll just go, well, is that true? Does it serve me? Does it help me or does it hurt me? Is it worth keeping or is it worth moving on? Because when you know how to manage your mind, you'll still have negative thoughts, but you'll see them like the weather rather than as a statement of fact. Mm. Uh, because thoughts aren't facts. No. They're just random connections often made in your mind. And it's not the thoughts you have that make you suffer. It's the thoughts you attach to that make you suffer. It's the thoughts you don't question that make you suffer. Yeah, two people can have exactly the same thought and their behavior to the thought will, could give completely different effects. So someone could um, behave um, and react to it in an anxious way and the body would respond that way. And someone else could obviously react in a different way and they wouldn't get that bodily response. Well, and it's the less than thoughts that really hurt people. Um, when I'm less than other people. So, you know, with the new book coming out, um, you know, I've had some books that were like number one in the country. And so, um, wow. and this book's doing great. But if I compare it, to my best book, or I compare it to Stephen Covey's book or some, you know, whenever you compare in a negative way, you feel bad. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't, people don't often compare themselves in a positive way no. because they fe would feel bad about it. It's like, oh, I'm narcissistic or something like that. And comparison, it's the inferior flawed dragon is driving the epidemic of teenage suicide that we really need to work. Um, and it's work on not comparing ourselves uh, because that is always gonna be someone richer, prettier, bigger, smarter, stronger. And there's always gonna be the other side. But when you look at what you don't have, you feel bad. And when you look at what you do have, you feel grateful. And so people should write this sentence down. Where you bring your attention determines how you feel. So if I can focus on the present moment and grateful for our conversation, I feel connected. Yeah. If I'm worried about what's not happening, then I feel less than which drives anxiety and depression. So just going back to the book, Dr. Amon, so you have the task that has um, write down your 100 irrational or anxious thoughts. How long would um, someone have to repeat that task for them to start to see a benefit? You know, it just depends on how diligent you are. Okay. So when people decide to get really healthy, 
they can see a dramatic difference in their bodies and their energy in three or four weeks. Um, but it's because they do it every day. Right. It's because it's not, oh, and, and people have the wrong idea about mental health. Uh, oh, you know, I challenged four thoughts and it didn't really help me. It's not going to work for me. Mm. And that's like eating four good meals and have expected to lose 40 pounds. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You have to do it. It's a practice over time, over and over and it over. It becomes part again. of your routine. It's part of your routine. Like my dad always hated when I said this, but I come from a family of fat people that I have a brother and sister that are 150 pounds overweight, but I'm not. Why? Because I've made tens of thousands of good decisions. If you want to be happy, it's about the moment by moment decisions you make every day and you have to make it a practice just like this morning I walked for 40 minutes because I do that every day I have to do the same strategies for my mind and quite frankly my mind's more important than my body because my brain and my mind create my body no, definitely. Um, in the book, you speak about the dragon tamer. Um, obviously, we've got the, the 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 dragons that have really come come to the forefront of so the anxious, the grief, uh, the sad dragon that you mentioned. Um, how do we start to tame these dragons and uh, and take control back over them? So I talk about the dynamic between your emotional brain, which is where the dragons cause trouble. And your thoughtful brain, your prefrontal cortex, the front third of your brain, which is largest in humans than any other animal. And mm. neuroscientists call it the executive brain because it's sort of like the boss at work. It directs things. And it's also like the brake. It stops you from saying or doing every stupid thing you think. And it's the dragon tamer. Because when your prefrontal cortex is strong, it can calm down the emotional influences breathing fire on your emotional brain. When it's weak because you didn't sleep or because you're eating bad food or because you used to hit soccer balls with your forehead, you never want to damage this part of the brain. But when it's weak, the dragons take over and run the show in your life, making you super unhappy. And the, yeah, there's so so many um, stories, unfortunately, now, isn't there, of people who were um, heading uh, footballs and things, and and it really having an effect on them. And I know you've done some studies in that area as well yourself, haven't you? Yeah, I know. I did the big NFL study when the NFL was having trouble with the truth about traumatic brain injury in football. And we've done hockey players and soccer players. And um, I've done four world champion boxers, including Muhammad Ali. And uh, it's not good. Damage the brain, you damage your life. No, that's, uh, yeah, thank you, obviously, for, for explaining everything with the book. I'm really excited for the DLC community to, to grab the book. Um, whereabouts can they grab it, Dr. Raymond? Um, where's the best place for them to get it? Well, if they order it between now and March 7th, I actually have four free gifts. So you can buy the book anywhere great books are sold. It's in the UK, it's in the United States and Canada. Um, and if they go to your brain is always listening.com and uh, put in their receipt number, there are four free gifts. One is a summary of the book. It's like a playbook. Here, do these. Because I know a lot of people um, have short attention span these days. <laughs> Two, there is a wonderful hypnosis audio program people can download for free. I'm a huge fan of hypnosis, especially for anxiety and sleep and peak performance. There's also a special event I'm going to do March 17th where I answer questions 
from only people who pre-ordered or ordered the book in the right. first week. And then they actually get a coupon for a free bottle of Happy Saffron. And Saffron, Happy Saffron is my favorite supplement that we make at Brand MD. It's a $50 value. But there are 21 randomized controlled trials showing that the dose we have in this supplement is as effective as Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Effexor to enhance your mood. Plus, it's good for memory. It's Were there any side for, effects, uh, Gasha? There are no side effects to saffron. And uh, I, I love this supplement. And, you know, at Amen Clinics, we're always thinking, first, do no harm. Use the least toxic, most effective treatments, which is why I'm a big fan of nutraceuticals or nutritional supplements. So if they pre-order now, order the book, uh, they can get those free gifts. No, that's wonderful. That just leads me to say thank you, Dr. Raymond, for your time. I know how precious it is. I know how much of a busy man you are. Um, obviously, you know, um, I love all the work yourself and Tana do, and it's been a pleasure getting to know you both on a professional level. Um, and, yeah, I'll, I'll do a, a, f a few swipe-ups um, for the community so they can grab the book, and um, I'll do some uh, shout-outs to your page where, obviously, they can see more about the, because I see I saw in the comments people are asking about the Amen Clinics, um, and I also saw that they were asking, um, someone saying, what was the name of the website again? Your brain is always listening.com. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Amen. Enjoy the rest of your day, and yeah, just continue doing the amazing work that you, you're doing for all of us. Well, thank you, and thank you for the work you're doing. Just need it now more than ever before. No, wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Erwin. Bye. Take care.